before I really start, I think this is the time also to the moment to uh, express a few very quick thankful notes here to um, my, some of my colleagues. So first of all, I'd like to thank the Friar University for having sheltered me, using here a word that has shown up here yesterday and today, abrigo, yeah, giving me shelter, um, especially in the person of Professor Gregor Stenrich and also my colleagues uh, in the research group. Francisco Alezag has been of great help throughout the beginning here, Susanne Neubauer, Pauline Bachmann, and I have to thank also my government, Brazilian government, through Capes Foundation, Ministry of Education, who made my voyage, let's use this term here, to, uh, to Berlin possible. Okay, um, let's uh, start here then, okay? Um, my, my paper, as we can see there, is called Light and Form, Brazilian and German Photography in the 1950s. That's exactly what I intended to research here in Germany, where I have been since last, uh, last August. And uh, in this uh, almost one year of uh, research here, a lot, I have discovered a lot of things I had no idea about. So it has been really very, very fruitful, actually. And what I'm presenting here today is just a very, very short, uh, concise uh, summary of what I have found out. Um, in 1951, German photographer and professor Otto Steiner stated that a new photographic style is one of the demands of our times. Furthermore, he said, only a photography sympathetic towards experiment can provide the means to the shaping of our visual experiences. In these statements, he points to some important issues that mark artistic production in Europe and abroad after World War II. In Germany, Steiner's times were those of rebuilding materially and spiritually what had been destroyed. From the rubble, a new landscape was to be constructed and bold ideas should arise, opening up pathways for original expressive possibilities, many of which obtained through extensive experimentation. The resulting visual experience of that period was both innovative and varied in its manifestations. In the US and Latin America, a renewal of the arts occurred as well. Through its rapid economic growth, most of the continent entered the 1950s with a desire for modernity. In Brazil, that decade's achievements manifested themselves on various levels. In the visual arts, a new generation emerged that was strongly influenced by European constructivist tendencies, as we saw here extensively in this last uh, yesterday and today. Hand in hand with the country's industrialization, its major cities, Rio de Janeiro and São Paulo, also grew. A new urban culture began to be established and entrepreneurs, many of which of European origin, invested in grandiose cultural venues such as the São Paulo Museum of Art, MASP in 1947, the Rio de Janeiro Museum of Art, Modern Art Museum, MAN Rio de Janeiro in 1948, and in 1949, the São Paulo Modern Art Museum, MAN, São Paulo. In 1951, a large retrospective of Max Bill was held at MASP. This exhibition is considered to be a decisive landmark landmark for many fledgling young Brazilian artists. Later that same year, Bill participated in the first Sao Paulo Biennale and his work, Tripartite Unit, was awarded the main prize. The Biennale was a major driving force. It was there that legitimized by its laurel for European concrete art, a group of artists established the Ruptura Group and in 1952 showed their work at Mans Sao Paulo. They published a manifesto where they stated their positions against the figurative art and with art with nationalistic contents, contents that had prevailed in Brazilian art up until then. They proposed to radically rupture with the past, distinguishing those, and I quote, that create new forms from old principles from those that create new forms from new principles. In the end of the 1940s and throughout the 1950s, Brazilian photography also underwent a process of renewal it began in Sao Paulo, specifically in the Fotocine Clube Bandeirantes, and I will abbreviate now FCCBB, and I will refer to it as such from now, from now on. This was an amateur association of photographers founded in 1939. In Brazil and abroad, these were spaces where amateur photographers met to share technical and aesthetical information, have their work shown, and published in the club's journals. Up until the mid-1940s, there prevailed in these circles a dated pictorialism in which photographers tried to imbue in their work 
qualities akin to 19th century painting. From early on, however, FCCB photographers valued technical aspects more as a means of artistic expression than an end in itself. In other words, they were already thinking of other things different from other such associations throughout, the, throughout Brazil and throughout the world. Um, their references look back, among others, at German avant-garde uh, trends in the 1920s, such as the Neue Seen, Neue Sachlichkeit. Moreover, by the end of the 1940s, they were strongly influenced by the visual of the modern urban landscape of Sao Paulo and the booming cultural environment in the recently opened museums where modern photography was also exhibited. And two examples here of this, in 1953, a group of uh, FCCB photographers had a special room in the second Biennale. This was the first time that uh, photography entered, let's say, this uh, uh, environment of modern art or institutional art. And two years later, in 1955, um, the same group, the FCCB, sponsored uh, at uh, Mans São Paulo the exhibition Otto Steiner and his students. This was, I won't be able to, to uh, uh, go deeper into this, but this was a very important um, uh, venue, actually, in, in Sao Paulo for Brazilian photography. Um, in the 1950s, modern photography opened up for experimentalism, expressing itself in a broad range of technical and formal exercises. In Brazil, attuned to some of these ideas, photographers began to interfere in the structure of the image and its perspectival representation of reality. Foremost among artists who turned to these questions were José Altisica Filho in Rio de Janeiro and Geraldo de Barros in São Paulo. These are the two uh, Brazilian photographers whom I have uh, worked more intensely in these last couple of years, actually. Otisica was the son of anarchist militant José Otisica and father, as we all know, of Elio Otisica. After graduating in engineering, he turned his interest to entomology, investigating butterflies and moths. He was, uh, and he became an expert in this. It's just as a quick side note, moths are attracted to light. They, they function in the dark, attracted to light, pretty much as photography is also done in the dark, in the dark room, and the camera uh, obviously attracts light as well. In 1942, he was hired as a naturalist by the National Museum. This was his lifetime job. He worked until he died uh, as a scientist at the National Museum. Two years later, he became a member of FCCBB and co-founded the Associação Brasileira de Arte Fotográfica, ABAF, in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and through microphotography, um, he, um, he learned the basic tools for for uh, photography. This was his basic scientific practice, and this is how he not only uh, became, uh, went, became to know phot photography, but also uh, developed his, uh, his techniques in photography. You see here a uh, uh, microphotography of uh, uh, genitalia of a, um, of a lepidopter, of a moth. Up until 1953, his production is markedly pictorialistic, in line with the trends, as we saw, of Brazilian and international photo clubs, where these photographs had large acceptance. The kiosk, for example, uh, was displayed in 145 salons. It was the most exhibited photograph during many, many years in all of these uh, photo associations throughout the world. It won many prizes and was widely published. On the other hand, what we see here, the negative, um, and the next one, the butterfly, these, I think, summarize what you see as pictorialist period. There were butterflies from 1954, and they refer to his multiple activities as an artist photographer and a scientist entomologist. Um, the next picture here is called Obvious Composition. This is a transition uh, from his uh, uh, pictorialist, let's say, photography to a more modern, eventually leading him to abstract photography. The print from the original photograph showing his son Cesar leaning on a handrail was painted with retouching ink to eliminate halftones and any reference to depth and physical space. The new image that emerged that we see here uh, from this intervention was then reproduced and reprinted. In other words, this was uh, his first uh, experiment, let's say, in intervening with the basic uh, means and supports of photography, in this case the photographic paper, where paint was applied to it. 
Yeah. Um, his next series, the Forma series, which he did from 1954 to 1958, he started the experiment with really abstract photography, where Chisica created his motifs using various techniques such as painting, collage, colored cellophane transparencies, and interven interventions directly on, on glass. Forma 18B, which we see here, for example, began with a montage of cellophane paper that was placed over photo paper and then printed like a photogram, outlining geometric shapes in black and white. The gray background that we see here is a result from light passing through orange cellophane. In other words, he used color, uh, color transparencies to generate grays. In other words, a blue would generate a certain kind of gray, orange another kind of gray, and so on. Yellow also he used a lot. Over this structure was placed a corrugated glass plate. The exposure of this to light, filtered and refracted by the glass, produces a positive print in which rigorous geometric shapes are diluted, texturized, lose their contours, and dissolve in the background, which purposely may merge with the surface. We don't distinguish any more surface from background in many, many of, uh, of what you seek as works. The next one, uh, uh, called Forma the 11th of 1958, uh, we see uh, this was uh, the initial, initial object of this was a painting in black ink. Um, the original of it still exists. Uh, he captured this original painting with the camera. This generated a negative, which was again photographed using high contrast film, a very new medium at that time. It's called Kodalit film. This was used in, in graphic arts for, for offset printing. Um, the superposition of three of these new negatives with a precise spacing between them projected on photo paper produced new geometric shapes. And here, Again, one no longer distinguishes surface from background, nor positive from negative. Um, his last series, called Recreações, 1958 to 1964, uh, is what I consider at least to be one of the most instigating of his entire production. It was during this period that Rochisica was in close contact with the new concrete artists, which, of, which, of whom we saw quite a bit here also, his last couple of, since yesterday. Uh, he also exhibited his work for the first time in Sao Paulo, not anymore just in the uh, photo club uh, circuits, but in, in galleries, in, in other, other circuits, and also in Rio de Janeiro. And this is when he started also dedicating himself also to painting. The images in, these, uh, in this abstract series were elaborated from cut shapes, intervention by painting, collage, and other procedures directly onto the film, on glass plates, and other transparent or translucent media, such as acetate, drafting paper, and meshes. The series includes both geometric as well as informal works, where the materiality and organic forms from brush strokes or folds of transparent and translucent materials are highlighted. Uh, he mastered photography's resources, always investigating their technical and artistic possibilities. In a text he published in 1955 in the Abaf Journal, he cried out, and I quote, Do not get tied up, I cannot. Everything can be done, but with taste. Free yourselves a bit from the camera and try to dominate it with the brain, this wonderful instrument God has given us. Liberated from its restricting optical apparatus, photography could open itself up to a complex experimental terrain in which the interplay between light and form played a very significant role. The same interplay, and this leads us now to the second Brazilian photographer, the same interplay resulted in Geraldo de Barros groundbreaking achievements in photography, an activity which surprisingly he only uh, engaged himself for only a few years in the beginning and again in the end of his life. He, in the beginning, he uh, only pho used photography as a means of expression for about two or three, maximum for two and a half years actually, precisely two and a half years. Uh, he started painting and then he started photographing. In 1949, he joined Photocine with Bandeirantes. He also became close to abstract painters, gathered around Mario Pedrosa in Rio de Janeiro, I mean, his, uh, his bio is enormous. I won't have time here to, uh, to, uh, uh, to develop on that. But he also was involved with, uh, with uh, 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 mental institutions as well in Rio and also in Sao Paulo. Also. He was active in the newly inaugurated MAM, Sao Paulo, where he met regularly with artists who would later form the Ruptura Group. 
In Mass, he held in 1951, again a groundbreaking exhibit, his Photoforma exhibit, utilizing architect Lina Bobardi's innovative exhibition spaces and displays. Here, hung, Barros hung his pictures on aluminum tubes, which extended from floor to ceiling, or on rectangular wooden panels over which several photographs were affixed. He included some photographs that were cut up in irregular shapes, disrupting photography's traditional rectangular format. We can see this here uh, in the back. In the back, yeah, this is a photograph of a. Oh, this is not working. Thing. Um, anyway. Right in the back there, we can see that he uh, photographed sort of a, uh, a grid, a, a metal grid, and then he cut it up in sort of a, an irregular trapezoidal shape. And then we can see how he brilliantly set up his exhibit in a totally unconventional way. Um, in a relatively short time span, he produced a large quantity of photographs resulting from the investigation into the possibilities of photographic language and technique. Through multiple exposures, scratching or painting, he worked on negatives and photographs taken from the visible world. He manipulated prints by drawing, cutting up or mounting them with others, backlighting, long shutter speeds, defocusing, and other on-camera adjust adjustments were utilized. And he made a series of photograms as well, possibly inspired by Moholy-Nodge's light compositions, one of his references in photography alongside Man Ray and Brassai. And here we see a few, um, this is one of his many, I would say, not so many, but a few photograms that he did. It's called Photoforma, has the same name as the exhibit. Here we have uh, a photograph of a detail of a wall, of an old rundown wall. He took a photograph, a uh, square negative. We saw uh, Miriam, no, who, who, Lena showed us, uh, who showed us the, the Holiflex? Miriam? Lena? Yeah. Lena, the Holiflex camera, which was the camera that he used. It, um, it utilized a six by six centimeter square negative. On the negative, um, he scratched and produced this, what he called homage to Paul Klee. And here, yeah, here we have uh, a work called Abstrato. I will refer back to this work again in the end of my lecture when we see a comparison with, of this with uh, some of the German productions as well. Um, okay, so now we move on. I know the time is... <laughs> we, have a, we have a time schedule, a very tight time schedule today. Okay, Wojciech and Barros were in the forefront of the modernist renewal of arts and photography in Brazil in the 1950s, exploring the potentialities of light, not only as a means, but also as an end in itself, they subverted photography's traditional vocation as reference of the real. By denying the temporal logic of the apparatus, they approach a more complex field, namely that of a fundamental time in photography, which Sika refers to this term um, in one of his writings, not, which is not measured by the shutter's fraction of a second. Radically questioning the essence of photography, which is seeking Barros, reached out to other photographers of their time, more specifically to those in Germany. And here we now uh, quickly go into Germany, go, come back to Germany. German photography started afresh just after the end of the war. Only a few of the mass of the so-called pioneer generation of the 1920s and 1930s remain active. Among them, Adolf Latzi in Stuttgart, he was re responsible for the first comprehensive post-war exhibit, De Photography, 1948, held in a still partially destroyed public building. One year later, Peter Kettmann, Ludwig Winstosse, Wolfgang Heisewitz, Siegfried Lautwasser, who had participated in that exhibit, were joined by Tony Schneiders and Otto Steiner and established the Photoform Group. With no bureaucratic procedures, nor written manifestos, what held them together was the common interest in a new in unconventional photographic language that, referring to the German movements of the 1920s and early 30s, attempted to translate the forms and spirit of their time. The group's name, suggested by Steinert, uh, pointed towards formal photographic experiments obtained through unusual framings or viewpoints, subverting technical aspects such as focus and exposure or from manipulation of darkroom processes. In May 1950, 
uh, in Köln opened the first Fotokina Fair, a show conceived for the, for the industry, celebrating the revival of German photography after the war and encompassing all aspects of professional and amateur photography. Various exhibits were held there, including a highly acclaimed photo form with 29 pictures that stood out for their bold content and unconventional hanging. And here we'll see three or four examples of this photo form. This is Otto Steiner. Homage to Oskar Schlemmer. Um, this is a montage of uh, various processes, including uh, photograms as well. Peter Kettmann, Öltropfen of Lasse, close up photography. Um, and again, Otto Steiner, Lampen at the Place de la Concorde. This he did with an open shot in the camera and using bodily movements. Uh, Long, long exposures and bodily movements to sort of paint with the, with the camera. Um, in 1951, Steiner, who was also a doctor by profession and a professor of photography at the Saarbrücken Schule für Kunst und Handwerk, organized the first of a series of three international subjective photography exhibitions. With 725 pictures by European and US photographers, it was Steiner's intention to show that worldwide, photography was attuned to modernity in form and content. Bridging the gap between the early modern avant-garde and contemporary production, he included works by Moholy Nodge, Raoul Hausmann, and Herbert Bayer, all of whom emigres, emigres who were active in Germany before the war. He also invited Man Ray to participate, thus contemplating in the exhibition's concept artistic movements from the Bauhaus constructivism to surrealism. Held in the still unfinished new building of the school, its design cleverly interacted with the unique architectural environment. The catalog had texts in German, English, and French. In the introduction, Steiner, Steiner stated that by showing a selection, and I quote here, the creative forces of in present-day photography, the exhibition attempted to shed light on the efforts of contemporary photography. The title he wrote referred to the personal creative moment of the photographer as opposed to what he called applied photography serving everyday or documentary purposes. And thus, the exhibition concentrates essentially on the photography that has been molded in form and content, in content and as such also molds the visual consciousness of our age. Um, a hardcover book was published then in 1952 the photos laid out in spreading pages with no captions were arranged not by authorship but by visual or technical affinities. Comprehensive texts in German and English expanded the theoretical basis of subjective photography. Counterpointing objectivity and subjectivity, the authors claimed that no photograph could actually be entirely objective, as behind the camera's viewfinder was a subject marked by individual characteristics. The essence of subjective photography thus lies on the fact that the camera, and I quote, is directed by the subject, that is to say, by man with his power of vision. Steinitz's subjective view praised individual, absolute photographic construction, construction aiming at self-contained autonomous pictures, which equal to painting or to other expressions reflected the art of their time. And here, some, another two examples. This is a bit later, 1967, but Steinitz still uh, developed this, uh, his techniques. And here, Joachim Lischke, Lischke luminogram number one, uh, again using various different darkroom uh, experimental techniques. Following the second subjective photography exhibit in 1954, Steiner published yet another book where he outlined its creative program. He envisioned what he called four stages of perfection in photographic creation. Number one, the reproductive photographic illustration, number two, the representative photographic illustration, number three, the representative photographic creation, and finally, the absolute photographic creation. The subjective photographs, he wrote, were only those that could be classified in the third and fourth stages, for they produce material for pictures that cannot be grouped under the usual stereotype of categories of photographic conception. And now as a conclusion, we can establish a parallel between Steiner's thoughts on modern photography subjectivity and, for example, Oitzikas on his own work, José Oitzikas. Eh? He argued that in his Recreações series, it did not make any difference whether they were obtained through photography or through painting. They are photography, he says, because they resulted from a photographic process as legitimate as any other. 
Ultimately, what interest him, interested him was form and its potential variations. And he stated this in an in interview to Ferreira Goulart, in, which was published in the Jornal do Brasil, which we saw here before also. Uh, similarly, Geraldo de Barros stated that for him, and I quote, photography is an engraving process, and that he only became a painter when he took the picture, chose his angle and his viewpoint. Regardless of what he picked out as a motif, he made, quote, a composition conducted only by rhythm, counterpoint, and plastic harmony. Like Elio, what he did was music, I guess. Um, my initial research into Brazilian and German 1950s photography points to a construction of a new transnational photographic language that while dialoguing with the various movements of renovation in the arts also sought affirmation of its own autonomous artistic status. In Germany, the photo form and subjective photography exhibits and publications played a very important part in this process. Seeking international visibility and exchange, the books were published in three languages, and the shows, or at least parts of them, traveled to various countries. Um, these are some more examples here. These are subjective photography. Now, this is Kagesheimer, Pathetische Composition, which I think has a very close affinity to some of Hoytisika's recreations. Um, Hans, Heinz Hayek Halke, Umamo, very complex uh, process of. Get, uh, of uh, obtaining this image, and here, and we are finishing in about one minute, um, Wolfgang Heisewitz, which I think has a very close connection to some, uh, to at least that one photograph we saw of Geraldo de Barros. Um, and as we saw here in, in many other presentations in this conference, beginning in the late 1940s, Brazil was rapidly inserted in international art circuits. In the 1950s, however, the artistic interchange came from Europe and the US and still occurred almost exclusively on a one-way path. Notwithstanding, art and photography in Brazil was constructing itself and attuned to worldwide practices. Exploring the medium's possibilities to its extreme, uh, Ochisik and Barros had a significant role in the process of elevating Brazilian photography to contemporary international standards. Their procedures were akin to those practiced overseas, reflecting the universal questioning of the statute of photography and investigating its elementary structure. When Oichisika proposed that photography should be done in the darkroom and that a photographic negative contains in itself, in a potential state, a world of new combinations, new problems, not only visual, but visual aesthetic, he was dialoguing with Steinitz and the subjective photographer's quest to create pictures resulting from, and I quote, valuable creative experiences of vision and form. In short, the new photographs that arose in the 1950s started existing in their own right and reflected that period's zeitgeist. Thank you very much. Thank you.